Hello and welcome to Sit with Hitlist, our award-winning uh, podcast and print series that's completely, totally unscripted. With me is Farhan Akhtar. Farhan, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much, man. Always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, Farhan, you're, I'm, I'm, of course, this would have been great to do this uh, in person, but one, that there is pandemic on in India uh, still very much. And, and you, are in, you are in LA, it's morning for you, it's night for me. Yeah, and both make it extremely difficult to make. Really? Like, are you are you a morning person, by the way? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I usually am someone uh, who likes to be in bed by nine thirty, latest ten, and I'm uh, up by six, so I can go and get all my training and everything done before the day really, really starts. Were you always this person? Like, or did you turn into a morning person at some point? I was a teenager also at some point. You know, <laughs> so I <laughs> I went through the whole thing of like uh, not wanting to wake up before eleven, twelve. That did happen for the last. Close to maybe 15, 16 years now, um, it's more or less been this way. So, ju- so just as my teens ended, I... You became a money person. So it's actually possible to do that, you mean? You mean you can, it's not a personality type. If you don't have to be a morning person or a night person, it, the two can become one or the other. My mom is, is a morning person. And uh, I mean, she's the one that I've grown up with. So that's something that I've seen as almost the normal in, in the house. So I think that's kind of what's gotten then into my into my system and my thinking and DNA. But during a party phase or something in your teens, you would be someone who probably uh, gets home at, in the morning, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a different time. I mean, they are just like, you know, you feel completely invincible and no matter what you do, nothing can happen. You know, so um, it's a different time. But and obviously, I mean, as you also know and anyone, you know, I mean, as, as time passes, honestly, the thing that you really owe yourself and you owe people who love you is um, is health, you know, it's good health. So if you can function healthily, you can be there for them and, you know, they don't have to worry about you and, you know, there's all that stuff that comes into it. So um, that's really what it is. Yeah. I think the viewers would have noticed that I did not introduce you at all. I just went straight to Farhan uh, That's also because introducing you is, a, is, is really long. It takes, it's damn long and, and, and so it's a, it's a bore. Like, you know, it's become a cliche. Actor, <laughs> singer, you know, director, producer, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Of course, we'll touch upon all those aspects of your creative life but one of the things that interests me at this point the most uh, thank you thank you for sparing me that boring intro yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the one person who's heard it a lot is me yeah. as you can imagine the most <laughs> but you know the one thing that interests me uh, at this point in this particular uh, segment of this conversation is actually you as a producer uh, Farhan and the fact that most people don't realize that over the past 20 years you really like raised and and run a, a really powerful and prolific production house in Bombay. And that's something that you managed to do while doing all those other things that you've also done in terms of a creative pursuit. Firstly, I want to know, Pran, why is your company called Excel? Is it an acronym? Is it an inside joke? What's up? Firstly, uh, no conversation about production in this company is complete without mentioning Ritesh Sidwani, who's you know, been my partner for the, since inception of Excel. Um, and honestly, his hunger when it comes to producing films um, and his ability when it comes to producing films um, is, is something that absolutely inspires me even now. You know, it always has. So when we got together and first kind of, of finding our feet, so to speak, you know, in terms of what it is that we want to do, we didn't imagine that 20 years later we'd still be working together and doing the same thing. It really was getting together to make one film. Um, And it was a great experience. And while he was making that film, of course, he was thinking of, because I wasn't a producer when when Dil Chata was made, right? I mean, I was there as the writer and director and he was producing the film. Um, And I remember having a conversation with him uh, where he said, listen, and I mean, this is honestly kudos to him, where he said, I mean, you're doing this and this is something that you want to, keep doing, it really is important that you keep ownership of your work. Maybe it's a business lesson that he's learned from from what he was doing earlier in his life. And so he spoke to me about that. It felt absolutely right to me. I mean, I did have enough background in production. I had worked in production for the last three and a half, four years. Um, And it felt like the right thing to do. Um, Not what I wanted to do, but the the right thing. Um, And uh, then we just had a couple of discussions and it completely eludes me because actually when Excel completed 20 years just recently, 
uh, him and I were sitting and, and chatting about uh, the name Excel. And we were trying our hardest to remember what that other name was. That Because there were two names that we were kind of tossing in between. Um, and for the life of me and for the life of him, we couldn't remember what it was. Uh, but there, there was a toss-up, I remember, between Excel and another. And, and to me personally, I mean, of course, um, apart from the meaning of Excel, just the word itself, it's also um, embedded somewhere in, my, in our school motto. There is no excellence without labor. Right. So, I mean, it's you want to be great at something, you have to work your, your ass off. Right. So basically, so we thought it just felt more right to us because that's the motto that we had grown up with. Um, and yeah, and that's why we went to Excel. Cheesy, but cute though, I have to say. Like you took your school motto and made it your... Uh... I mean, on some level, yeah. I mean, How did it work in the sense that I know you guys went to the same school, but you also went to the same college. Is that, uh, is that how it was? We went college only for the first year together. Um, he continued. I did not. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> but were you studying the same course? Were you doing commerce? Uh, yes, we were doing commerce. Uh, I don't know why I was doing commerce. Him doing commerce makes perfect sense. I remember when dad uh, narrated the script of Lux to me. What I could totally relate to was that, that career dilemma that that character has in the first half. You know, I was that guy. You know, I was just My friends are going and doing commerce in this college. Sounds like that'll be fun. At least we'll be together. You know, and, uh, and I went. I paid no attention to... Um, my inclinations, I paid no attention to what it was that I was enjoying doing at that time. Um, it was all very external. Um, and uh, I, I I mean, the college was great. Um, I made a bad choice, you know, of, of doing something that I honestly had very little interest in. So that's where things went a little bit uh, off, off the rails for me. Right. But the fact that you actually, you know, met him, so maybe commerce was not such a bad idea. You actually got to meet who became your partner. No, but I mean, we already knew each other since school. So, I mean, it wasn't really meeting when we got into college. Um, in fact, when we got into college after that first year, when I left, um, after that, there was a window, I would say, of roughly about five or six years from the age of, I guess it was 15, 16, maybe at that time, uh, from 16 till about 20, 21, somewhere there where our paths didn't cross that much. I got into a completely different circle of friends. I started working in production. He was still studying. Um, he joined his family business. Um, I was working with Adi Pocha and Script Shop. You know, so we, we didn't really meet that much. We had, of course, we knew each other. We had common friends. Um, but we'd meet maybe when we were out at night. We never made plans with each other. Um, none of that happened. And then we connected again. Um, I think in our mid twenties, when when the circle of friends, kind of his circle of friends and my circle of friends that we had formed in the last five six years, kind of came close together, and then we started hanging out again. Yeah, because he's a person from a completely different background, right? In terms of like a kitchen appliance company, that's that's the company that he joined, which is presuming nothing to do with films per se. No, no, not at all, not at all. I mean, the closest he came to film was putting a VHS tape into his VCR player. That's, that's the process. <laughs> he came to having any active participation in making in the playing of a film. I must tell you something very funny. So we were chatting, and I had no idea that his family business was was Marlex. I didn't know that. I mean, I knew he's he does business, but I had no idea that that's what his family business was. So when we started chatting, so he was like, "Yeah, you know, Marlex." I was like, "Oh, dude, like you know, Marlex was your company." So he said, "Yeah, I was." So I have to tell you that when I was a kid, right, my mom was very very dear friends. Actually, so was my father were very dear friends with Gautam Rajadhyaksh, who that incredible photographer who unfortunately left us too soon. So they were really good friends. And Gautam was signed on uh, by, by an agency to do a photo shoot for a pressure cooker ad. Right? So he was doing just the stills for it. And at that time, I mean, there wasn't really, there weren't many films shot on, you know, uh, moving films. If you remember that Slate used to come on TV with a voiceover, right? So um, he, he needed a kid to look really excited and like kind of look into that pressure cooker and feel like this is the best butter palau I've ever eaten in my life. That expression, right? So uh, Gautam was at home and he told my mom, he's like, listen, can Farhan do it? Because I'll just shoot it with him. And you know, like um, he's the right age that they want and stuff like that. And I was really naughty when I was that age. So I think he was like, let me take him because he has a bit of a mischievous streak about him. My mom said, will you do it? And it's a photo. So I was like, yeah, okay, cool. 
so i shot that photograph and that photograph actually became like the the kid in the photo with enjoying this thing photo for a long time for this pressure cooker company this is i'm talking about this is the 80s so i was like you know i did this and he was very confused and he was like you shot this for marlex so i said no it was for your biggest rival hawkins <laughs> <laughs> so we were rivals when we were kids <laughs> and now here we are collaborating the combine <laughs> the coming together of two giants from <laughs> opposite sides of this kitchen corporate world <laughs> <laughs> but you know like even for you as a creative person uh, for on the fact that you found a producer right in your first film and then after you stuck with the same person i mean that's a huge relief isn't it like for most people they could you know they end up writing scripts they keep looking for someone to back them to take care of at least the money aspect but and and the other aspects that come with film making that's a huge relief for you 100% i don't know how you can put a value to creative synergy you know when you find someone or a group of people that you have that synergy with things will always come along like they've come they must have come along for him they've come along for me um but it's like you know where someone will come and say dude your film has done so well let me pay you so much more money to come and do a film direct a film for for my company for example you know and and this did happen after diljata a lot because i mean we were very young we had made just one film so suddenly after diljata there were big producers you know who would reach out and say uh, love your movie come and work here uh, you know whatever you're getting paid you'll get paid x more you know to do it and you can keep the 50% of the rights of it with you and all this stuff did happen you know but the fact is that it just felt right when you're working with someone and you realize that there is no reason to to try and change anything you know um and here is a guy who again is someone who's trusted you who hadn't made a film before with his money right and and going out there and putting his neck on the line because i wouldn't have lost i mean i would have my reputation would have taken a beating and i probably won't make another film again but for someone who left his family business saying this is what i want to do they were all really stressed out because film making is a risky business you know i mean you can lose a lot of money and then the freedom that i got to make it i think because again of knowing him since we were kids there's always been a, a trust factor so uh, it you never feel um, and you honestly I, i hope and i think i can't speak for him is you know that this person has your back at all times you know because it's it's not just a business relationship it's it's a lot more than that i've never ever felt that i i want to be out there doing a, a film with someone else um i mean it it does happen when i can act for someone else because that's a script that comes along that that you know excites you and you want to do something about it but not as far as production and not as far as uh, directing i mean this to me is is home you know and, and and it's and it's always felt like that it's not something that i started feeling 10 years down the line um it just immediately and so i i never felt any kind of reason or any pressure or any uh, or, or tempted beyond uh, my wildest imaginations to to have to go out and do anything right but you know that two but that two still all the same school same college but two separate worlds in a certain way a person uh, who understands numbers perhaps a little better than you would or perhaps understand deals a little better than you would i don't know i'm just assuming as two personality types oh yeah of course of course he's uh, known in our industry to be a hard negotiator you know and and the thing is that when when i hear that about him uh, i actually feel great because it's when you're in business being a hard negotiator is a good thing you know i mean that's that's what you're supposed to be um and um, and people respect him because he he's always there for people i mean the fact is from for someone who has no education in production background and that's not 20 years down the line i mean this started 6 years 7 years down the line you know after lakshy and don and honeymoon travels we had done four films by then by 2006 um to have producers call him to find out you know how is it that we are doing certain things because i mean we had started producing films very differently from from the way it was done before the system that we followed which is very common where i am now in in la it's a very common system and has been for years but it wasn't common in uh, in india things were more uh, kind of put together slab bang as opposed to the a structure being created in production where everybody is answerable to somebody just kind of above them in a in a, in a job function 
so to learn that i mean a lot of people would call him and ask him how he was doing it so now you talk about someone who's just started 6 years ago you know with with absolutely no background in production to suddenly have this kind of people reach out to him to find out how he's doing things you know it's it it speaks volumes about his um, ability as you rightly said i mean this was going to be that for that one film that you made which was dil chahta hai and i saw the opening credits of dil chahta hai before this conversation just to get a sense of uh, you know where you guys were headed in terms of you know i even saw that the film was insured by united insurance company um and ajit gupta is also in, you know in the in the opening credits because i'm presuming some mr ajit gupta would have helped out with the insurance the film was actually insured which is not something that i'm sure is even common now now i think uh, a lot of uh, films and shows are in short but it wasn't common back then i mean at that point also thinking that i mean at the end of the day what you are creating is a product you know so when you're creating a product i mean products can be in short you know <laughs> so i mean and I, and i guess it was just that hat and it, uh, and again see the, the thing is that when you look to to the west it was very common place i mean all films were in short you know against some calamity or the other you know um and uh, so it it was it's just that it wasn't possible to insure a film in india i would imagine because of you not being able to qualify for insurance because of the way the system you worked under you know that you can only get dates whenever someone has dates you know you don't have contracts with actors to say okay i start here and i finish here you know so when you don't have all these things it's not possible to insure something uh but when you have all those contracts in place which which is something that ritesh did ensure um then you can right i mean i'm i'm sure this is not an insurance against commercial failure or success right i mean that is a risk that anyone's going to take in any no 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 that that nobody can insure i i know that dil chahta hai was a film was a quote and quote multiplex film before multiplex is really like you know the boom happened a little later uh but was it a commercial success was it was it something that was like considered a hit at the time it came out for us yeah it was a hit um it did well um i mean obviously we also came on the back of two of the biggest successes that india had seen till that point you know uh so we released um on the 10th of august um on the 15th of june if i'm not mistaken was uh, lagan and gadar you know on this on the same day so i think gadar at that point had become the the biggest commercial success that india had ever seen uh lagan was also a very successful film and of course had captured the nation's imagination in a way that money can't quantify so on the back of that like a month and a half later you know um we came out we did i mean we did well not as well as those two films but i mean for its time and for our budget we did we did really well and of course got a tremendous amount of critical uh, acclaim uh so it was all in all uh, an absolutely successful film but um, i mean of course i mean we went under the shadow of of two gigantic oaks that had come just before us yeah you can't remember if there was another title that you thought of for excel entertainment but is there any other title that you thought of for dil chahta hai was that or was that the original title all through uh no when i was when i was writing the film um i had a working title which was called hum teen is what the title hum teen was was the title anyone when i narrated it to them and i said i'm thinking of hum teen would have to immediately take some kind of an anti allergy tablet <laughs> it just somehow didn't didn't work for people so then i changed it and i kept thinking and thinking and this one uh felt like it felt felt right i mean it just came from you or did someone suggest this i uh, know it it did come from me um i i remember when i told my dad he was the only one who said you know it's it's a good title but uh, it's incomplete so i said what do you mean so he says nobody ever says because i my theory behind it was whatever i feel you know like what i feel like you know like it's 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 my wish you know like that kind of thing that that that, that was the attitude at least behind it so he said in in english that works he's like but in hindi dil chahta hai is incomplete you said dil kya chahta hai like what you'll have to tell me what your what your heart desires you can't just say my heart desires right so um so i said yeah so now you have to do something about it because this is the time <laughs> so i said so he, he's like oh, you're going to I, I'm assuming all films had a title song, so that was just the the way you made films. I mean, even now, I guess films have a title song. So he was like, "Okay, I'll. I'm thinking about it. In the song, it means that we'll make a song. 
so i said please do ah, huh. so then sense. he gave it the nahi beete chamkeene din na rahe yaaro ke right right so right. all of that came into it uh, in the song right you know i was having a conversation recently with ravi k chandran uh-huh. who was a cinematographer uh, with dil chahta hai and one one of the things that he told me was how completely blown he was by your level of confidence for someone who's making his first film uh and of course the movie was over and he told me that you know he actually showed the film first to mani ratnam uh down in chennai and then mani ratnam actually called you or he spoke to you uh yeah and, he did and said that you know what don't change a word don't change a scene just let it be the way it was because you were facing pressures on changing certain aspects of the film finally like the negative was edited the 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 colorist of the film the uh, uh sound design of the film all of it was done in chennai uh the, all the better studios and the better uh, post production facilities for that were in chennai at that point so that's why and also ravi lived in chennai so it was easier for him to go and do his uh, I, there was no di back then you know i can't even remember what it was called it's such a long time ago to kind of uh, you know like the the recolorist of the film so to speak the grade um so i that's when he was also of course he he worked closely with mani they were associates so he did show him the film and my, when i mean when mani ratnam calls you and says good things about your film you know you know you've done something right everyone was constantly um whoever saw the film um was had issues of the length of the movie um there were some people who felt like you know the the first half of the film uh till till the interval moment where uh, akshay and amir fight um a couple of people felt that they had no idea what this film is about and where is this film going you know what am i looking forward to in the film i mean okay it's great it's nice episodes in life and people are laughing and people are traveling and someone is in love and someone is falling out of love and all that's going on but uh, what is it about you know <laughs> there was there was a lot of that that happened um so yeah i mean there was a little bit of pressure to kind of think about should we restructure the film in some way um are there certain scenes that need to be removed you know to maybe tighten it up and uh, shorten the length Uh, all this was going on so i would speak to ravi about it because obviously it included then ravi having to make those changes um at his end um and uh, yeah mani sir did speak to me about it you know and he told me that he absolutely loved it and don't do anything it's uh, it's a new form uh, in some way you know and people will will understand it or they won't understand it he's like but you have to do what you feel is 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 right with it and i mean that absolutely will give me a major boost of of confidence to to at least you know i mean if somebody uh, told me again like you know you should them like do it's either what you like or money that them likes I'll, yeah. i'll go with <laughs> with with what he, with what he think works you know you spoke about how it it's not about anything in particular but that's that's the beauty of the film because there's certain things in that movie that people recount again and this really doesn't mean anything for instance that the dialogue hum cake khane ke liye kahi bhi ja sakte hain yeah i mean it really doesn't mean anything in particular but it, it stuck around it's people people use that even now 20 years later what is this is there a story behind it there is a there is a story about it which is uh, my absolute love for cake okay. is is a story about it and and there was a long time when which I was telling when after i left college and before i started working which is that time when i was watching films at home sitting around you know not doing that much this is the time you were current shergil from lakshya right yeah basically the time that i was current shergil so to speak i've always had a, a serious sweet tooth right so if if we ever went somewhere and i i saw i don't know like you know that time of course we didn't have as many uh, uh, options of uh, eating cake or eating a pastry when you were out but if i ever saw something in a window i would be like man i wish i could afford to buy that that pastry right now because you know it's presented so well kept in that window and i was a member of uh, of this uh, club uh, at hotel sirock which no longer exists right there was a club there and they they used to have this little counter which had all these amazing like black forest and chocolate truffle and all these things and i mean i could never afford to buy it um and if somebody ever said listen uh let's go somewhere it's my treat and i'll get you and it was the happiest day of my life <laughs> to be able to get to be able to get that piece of cake so um that i just thought it would be like a fun line you know like to kind of just throw in there because i mean uh, obviously uh, sami's character is someone who can afford to buy cake but um, just the thought and and i think that's what struck people you know when you were in college and it's it's that lot who when you know like for a free meal or for a free drink 
you know if someone takes you somewhere to right. someone it's fancy, anything yeah. you know i mean it's like wow what a great what a what a wonderful treat you know i'm i'm absolutely coming so yeah that's kind of where it came from is there an inside joke to uh, you know i was i was watching your table read of uh, zindagi na milegi dobara and uh, you know you use the portion where uh, this is boy boy yeah, yeah. you know is there is there, is there an inside joke is there a story behind is the i'm assuming in dube ji right he he was mr dube who we uh, kind of based the he, he was a a a, a pe instructor is who he was yeah okay so there is actual person yeah there is an actual person i mean of course we exaggerated it a little bit you know um, in the film but but he 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 did say i mean like he he would say boy like but we made it a little bit more uh, phonetically boy and all that stuff but he'd say boy uh, that would happen um and and yeah i mean he was he would uh, use uh, he would love using the in the middle of his sentences so yeah there was a little uh, a little uh, love and tribute to him in the film it was very sweet his daughter called me after watching the film yeah okay. his daughter called me after watching the film and she was like it was so sweet to see that you all still remember. you know like kind of remember my father and your love so i said yeah i mean of course yeah, he, all the such like, great impressions left on our minds you know from from those years right so there is a mr dubey a uh, 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 pt instructor at manik ji cooper who's now like literally immortalized on screen yeah he's immortalized on screen unfortunately again even he's passed away so when his daughter had called me she told me i mean he's not he's not with us anymore but i mean uh, he would have been really really happy to see that zoya and you still still remember him like this. Yeah. what about chapora fort i mean that's that's called dil chahta hai fort now I, did you ever think that that's going to become so iconic? Was it area that is gone? Was it a recce thing, or was it some a place that you've hung out before, or it's just there? No, I mean it. It actually is. A, it it's. I can't say it's a recce thing because I've been there before when I on my trips to to Goa. I mean, you know, you just go hang out with friends uh, and stuff. But um, I can't say that uh, you know these things. I mean, I I don't know how they happen here. You know, um, it. I remember like the, I used to always love the view from up there. um and but never in my wildest imagination when i was there did i sit and have any kind of deep thought you know of of the kind that uh, uh, akshay's character has uh, when they are staring out of the thing but um yeah i mean i just love the view and there's that confluence of that little river thing also that happens there we know that the river comes and uh, uh, ends there and then you can see uh, more gym and mandrim and all across to the other side it's just a spectacular view um and that's really what i wanted for that scene i just wanted something that that would because dil chahta i mean for most of it was a very indoors film you know it plays out in 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 apartments and in homes and um in cafes or you know and like so goa was a nice break away from from that so it really was wanting to just bring a little bit of like kind of scale and a little bit of openness to to the eye um and that was one of the locations that i remember feeling that way in. you know it it felt very open you know and and airy and bright and um so we went there and then i mean yeah i mean i guess it's just the the way eventually we got them to to sit on that thing to like you know one completely frame, relaxed right? yeah you know that frame i think that just their backs you know so it leaves a lot to your imagination i i think that's that's what it is um yeah that just uh, that just stayed with people right was akshay khanna the first person you approached to to act in the film paran was was he the first lead actor in- uh yeah akshay akshay and and preeti were the were the first two because i mean they on on some level um had i had told them that i'm writing the script and they had said come to me when you're and you knew them because i mean if i'm not mistaken you were an assistant director on himalaya putra which would be akshay's first film as an actor or as a lead actor anyway so that was in 1994 uh and actually that was the first time that i ever met him i didn't know him before that. um so i met him when i was working on himalaya putra and and we kind of hit it off really well um and i did tell him at that point you know like i didn't say that i'm writing a script i did tell him that my fantasy is to to kind of make my own film and you know so and he said that listen i mean you come and meet me whenever you do because uh, i'd love to hear it and that was that um so i took him up on that offer um and uh, preeti was someone who i had met while i was writing I was working at script shop at the time. I was writing. I just started writing the script of Dil Chahta Hai. It's very interesting, actually. Her and Akshay were auditioning for Kya Kehna, right? So uh, at that point, Akshay was in the film. Uh, they were looking for someone new to cast. Preeti still hadn't had her release of Dil Se and all that stuff hadn't happened yet. 
um, but she came home for an audition and Akshay and her did an audition um, in the house and that's when I met her um, and we just started talking and um, uh, you know, and she said I'm, uh, I told her that there's a script and she said listen you please come and meet me whenever it's done uh, I'm sure it'll be this that and the other and then of course her films released she became like a, a massive star you know um, and um, but kept her word you know when I went and met her and I said I'm doing this uh, she was like yeah I mean I'm, I love it I'm totally on so they were the first two. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, there is Lakshya after that for you as a director. There's Dawn after that for you as a director. And that's the, that's the beginning uh, of the decade, as it were, right? I mean, 2001 is when we're starting from. But by the end of the decade, uh, Farhan, you became a completely different person. I mean, of course, 2011 is when you made Dawn 2. And yeah. you just completely disappeared from direction altogether. But was it a conscious choice not to direct and be a full-time actor? Was there a moment we thought that's what's going to be? You know, I, I, I mean, I, I guess what you see is like a full-time actor, of course, because that's my, my the only visible work out there. Right. But I mean, I was uh, very involved in, in producing a lot of things. Um, I was very involved in, in writing things, like writing dialogue for Talash, writing for Dil Dharat Me Do, um, you know, like working with different directors, doing that stuff on right. Rock On 2. Um, so all that, there was a lot of writing going on. Music came into my life in a very big way. Um, at that time as well, I, I actually took almost a year and a half, even away from acting and away from 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 doing anything else, to write my album, you know, and go record my album. Um, so a lot of things happened at that time. There was some some kind of desire to creatively extend myself in in different ways, um, and um, yeah, I just felt like I mean, you have to do what you have to do. Yeah, man. and I I'm not one of those people who wants to look back at my life with with any kind of regret. You know, um, you do different things when they work great. When they don't, you learn, you know, something from it at least. You know, and, and that's what I believe in. So um, in the last 10 years, I mean, uh, apart from, of course, producing, writing and, and doing my music. Um, so it's it has kept me really, really busy. There was the first the beginning as an actor uh, with Rock On that gave you that whole segue into music uh, as a career. Uh, were there like musicians? Uh, who sort of inspired you, who were around you. Are you a taught musician? Have you, have you learned uh, music in, in a real sense? I learned music for two or three years when I was a child. Um, but my fascination for music has, has just never died. Um, I, I wanted to play guitar, so I, I, I'm self-taught. Um, I, I taught myself how to play from the age of about 16, 17 onwards. Um, I, I, I started playing. Like a chord book? You just took the chord book and you just took it out? Uh, at that point, yeah, the uh, a chord book, when, when the internet revealed its magic, then I could start like kind of learning more, you know, from, from downloading things from there and, and learning how to play. It was a very private passion. Um, and Rock On, for me, brought it front and center in some kind of way. Um, it, it really opened my mind as to possibilities of experience, you know, when it comes to music. Um, and, and that's when I started with a, like an inkling of an idea that it would be nice to kind of get a like-minded bunch of people together and create a band of some kind, which we then finally came together in 2012, I think it was. Right. Right. Um, and since then, I mean, we've just had an incredible time. You know, I mean, like I've gone to over a hundred cities now, if not more, you know, in India and performed at various colleges and festivals and things. Um, we've traveled to, to the US twice with the band to play. Um, gone to Australia to play, gone to the Middle East to play. It's just incredible. Yeah. You feel blessed that you're able to do it, you know, and that, that you have this opportunity to go in and share that passion and share that, that love for something with, with groups of people. Um, it's an incredible feeling. You know, you're talking about other stuff to do with filmmaking per se and not just acting. Uh, and even in the ones that you acted, of course, in luck by chance, you were not the writer. Uh, or not even the direct writer, but in the other films, like say, Zindagi Na Milegi Dubara, you were the designated dialogue yeah. writer. Even in Dil Dharak Ne Do, you wrote the dialogue yeah. of, of that film as well. These were all directed by Zoya. So, you know, one of the things that I've always uh, wanted to ask you, Farhan, is, uh, you know, both of you, like, I think a year apart as siblings, uh, grown up together, both of you are filmmakers. How different are you uh, as writer-directors? I mean, if you were to like so somehow like break down that process, how you are different from Zoya in terms of how she approaches film, in terms of how she writes, in terms of how she directs on the set, perhaps also. I, I don't think there's any clear answer to this, Mayank. You know, I mean, because we are all we are so alike yet so different. 
you know um so it's 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 tough to really pick threads from from this this kind of fabric that we share together you know um it, it's not easy um zoya is you met her you know she's again i mean she's incredibly passionate about what she does um I, and i think she's more open about her feelings you know um she's she's more of a people's person i think than i am uh that that i i i do feel she's 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 better at communicating her thoughts um and i think because she speaks with a lot of clarity when she's when she's communicating her, her, her thoughts people i feel somehow um they somehow feel a lot more comfortable with her. i i i tend to keep things more inside so a lot of people have i i think they they end up they end up wondering they don't know what i'm thinking right now which can be unnerving sometimes or you know or it can make an an actor feel anxious you know or, or it can make a uh, uh, a technician feel anxious that i mean why is he not saying what's going <laughs> you know i mean that there, there is that like she's a lot more more open with her with the communication i mean I, i i do try but i don't think i'm as good as her and um i i think as writers reema and her have they balance each other's strengths and weaknesses out really really well you know so i i do feel that in the last these last 10 years uh, i mean her her growth from uh, from zindagi to dil dhadak mein do to gali boy you know uh, as a writer and as a director has been has been amazing you know um, i mean you she has the ability to like find incredible nuance um, in things um, and say things that really uh, mean a lot and matter a lot in in very um non dramatic ways um and and that's a great ability for a writer to have for me i'm i i'm i'm inspired by writing I'm absolutely loving that the three of us now are collaborating on a on a script together you know on gile zara together so um i'm i just want to get in there and spend some time with them and and uh, learn here i mean you've written alone practically uh, all those scripts and even dialogue writing per se is something that you would do on your own you probably go off to some place and sit i have never written um, till actually till dialogue draft of dil dhadak mein do uh was the only time that where zoya and i not really sat together but um we were doing a lot more back and forth um on on that dialogue because there were so many characters in in that uh, film you know i constantly wanted to like kind of send her stuff to read because once you develop a certain tone and a, a style for one character then i didn't want to like kind of let her be happy now because then i'm going to apply that to the to the rest of the film so there was a lot of back and forth on that film but apart from that i mean every time i've written be it for her films be it for uh, any film that i've done screenplay and dialogue for for when i wrote for talash for when i wrote for game for when i wrote for uh, kartik or kartik for when you know all these films um i i i tend to do it by myself so um for me this is going to be actually a new experience uh working on on screenplay and on on uh, maybe not dialogue so much but at least on screenplay uh with with two other writers so hands on just to let the viewers know right now i am in a uh, bandstand right down the street from like a few buildings away is salim khan lives um i which is a hyphenated public figure in the sense of it's salim javed but effectively salim khan wanted to be an actor right and um, and he did about 25 films if i'm not mistaken but he realized that it is not going to work out for him as a leading man and so you know he he took the choice and he decided to be a writer likewise javed akhtar wanted to be a director and he always says that when he came to bombay did you at some level uh, faran did you sort of fulfill his dream uh, as it were or was that or are we making it too melodramatic uh, no i think we are making it too melodramatic <laughs> <laughs> um you know i actually didn't know that he wanted to direct films till uh, I, i would maybe say till uh when lux was being made till then i i really didn't know i mean uh, also i mean you like the 90s for him he was so busy writing songs i mean it, like i mean i think almost every second film or every third film the songs were written by him you know he was working with everyone um and he was really really busy so i had, i mean for me um we never at that point really had a conversation about you know what his desires were because he had always been busy for me so i just thought this is what he wants to do you know uh, it's when we were doing lunch um and because he was writing it um and i was directing it and that's really when like kind of at one point he just you know kind of spoke to me about um uh, about uh, having wanted to direct and 
uh, this is going to be a very challenging film you know like that kind of stuff had happened and uh, and I was like okay i didn't know that you wanted to direct but that's that's kind of when i found out at the age of 29 that is right and of course you would be down the street on the other end of bandstand afran is that that that's where you grew up uh, as well and of course you moved from there now it... uh, no 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 i i i'm i've had a temporary um, uh, migration uh, but i'm i'm on my way back i'll be i'll be back on bandstand the point i'm trying to get at uh, uh, is you know javed akhtar son salim khan's son same street all right grew up on the same street but when i look at salman khan and his body of work it's almost like an antithesis of farhan akhtar and his body of work it's almost like they did not grow up on the same street and they're certainly not you know a, you know kids of of two people who are like almost one person uh, known to the world for so many years right like what you stand for as a as a public figure someone who would you know who's who's on your mard as an as an initiative of yours or you'd say things like you know which is all about uh, no uh, men being okay with taking no for an answer and that's a very important facet of what you what you sort of uh, go out and talk about even in colleges if i'm not mistaken but you know salman khan is like this commitment de diye to that masculinity is salman khan i mean do you see any irony in this at all one can't live their life in comparison with somebody else's you know um i i do what i i have to do and what i feel is right he does what he does i mean i know him really well and i know that he's an incredibly warm loving you know person um and he is truly a, a friend's friend you know he'll he'll be there for you if you ever need him so i i know all this about him and and that's what matters to me most um his choices in film i his choices you know in film we are nobody to judge uh, or to say what's what's good and what's bad the the interesting part of your question really is I mean, is is yeah. I mean, our, our creative paths are different, you know, uh, and and we do come from the same pool, which is a pool that that Sunny Bunkel and 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 my father uh, kind of created in terms of that's the world we grew up in, and those are the films we knew. Um, but why that happens and how that happens, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess you're a product of your environment in some in some kind of way. Um, and um, I mean, he's massively successful. I I don't think we should question his choices at all. He's <laughs> done extremely well. <laughs> in terms of like you know uh, the persona like you would typify uh, for lack of a better word uh, a metropolitan uh, urban uh, and in terms of the audience also i mean but you change that with bhag milka bhag and i i i saw a sort of interesting story of yours in another conversation where the reason why you changed that or at least you you what drove you was a woman that you met in chandigarh uh, who had an issue with you playing uh milka saying because she would have liked a punjabi person to play it and you turned that into a challenge and you actually went back to chandigarh after the film to to just show her like did you like this or not it should be like there should be a dedicated score in the opening credits i unfortunately can't remember her name she was part of a larger press contingent that had come uh to meet to meet milka ji more importantly when he was announcing that her film is being made on his life I I didn't go there to tell her oh look I did it it wasn't it wasn't that I honestly I mean I actually when I because when I went I didn't remember her name I just remembered what she what she looked like um so I I did I I thanked her actually you know she she really did help me um so that's what it was I I just said I wanted to like really thank you because I what you did was you made sure that I didn't take it lightly I mean I of course would have applied myself and I would have done all that needed to be done but at times something just gives you a certain um uh, a little bit more of a boost a little bit more of a reason i did think in that moment when that question was asked that if she feels this way i'm sure there must be others who feel this way or think this way too you know and and it's important for not just for me it's important for akesh it's important for milka ji that uh, when people see the film they still don't feel feel that when said yaar kashi punjabi actor le liya hota you know that that feeling should happen so um it actually served as great motivation not not in any kind of negative way you know not not in any kind so i was i was thankful that she said it actually it it really helped me bhag milka bhag uh, for whatever it's worth it really started a whole stream of sports films and sports biopics actually god knows how many we watched ever since so it, like like the way dil chahta was a trend setter of like quote and quote uh, multiplex movies this became like every you know so many films was for that i think even dawn did the same thing with you know a whole lot of film started getting remade after after dawn like you do something and then there after what do you make of a film industry or entertainment industry that starts doing the same thing again and again um i know it's a compliment but how do you perceive it 
when you see that becoming a formula as it were i, I don't know man i mean i just put my head down and continue with what i have to do here you know honestly in in any business i guess you know when when something is successful other people will will want to get a get in on the action you know i mean a car sells with a certain kind of artificial intelligence system now then everybody jumps onto that bandwagon and all cars need to have artificial intelligence because that's what people like you know um, and i mean some product has one x new flavor in in its chip packet suddenly everybody has that same you know it, it's 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 how life is it's how this world functions you know i mean something does well people feel that okay this could be the what people are interested in and and it purely comes from that it's a decision saying that oh our audience seems to be enjoying this in this moment that doesn't mean you do it badly of course you know and it doesn't mean that you just do it for that reason only you still have to give something of some value uh, to them you know so all that is a must but um, uh, it's very normal for that to happen it's very very normal for that to happen. right i mean of course i've just i mentioned the successes uh, so to say and i think the best stories or at least the best lessons uh, faran come from what are not successes i mean from failures for lack of a better word of putting it to faran over the years 20 years when you look back is there anything uh, that you look at and say maybe you could have done it differently and i could i'm going to throw a couple of examples at you uh, for you to respond to them first and then of course answer the larger question like say for instance did you think uh, rock on to did not turn out the way you would have liked it was there was there something that you felt as a viewer much later of course i'm sure you're doing the best while you're making the movie um no i don't actually like like they say water finds its own level na at the end of the day is is kind of what it is so we we told a story the story does have a heart you know um uh, which is which is important in a film like that the thing is that with that film it's it's tough to gauge um because i i know people who didn't get into it I, you know i also know people who who absolutely love it um like i think with with the first rock on it was i mean unanimously a lot more people loving it than than not liking it with rock on 2 i think it was a little bit more mixed for sure but uh, we also got absolutely like slapped in the face with demonetization you know happening like two days before our film release we had no idea like i mean we were not excited Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, like at the end of the day, you saw it, it suddenly, like you felt like the, the the kind of carpet was pulled out from under your feet. People um, don't have enough money to go and buy food for their homes. You know, uh, they're queuing up uh, to get two thousand rupees out of a machine so that they can they can buy food. You know, uh, the uh, people some people are dying because they've had to stand in queues for that long. Um, in the middle of that, to how do you go and like celebrate anything? you know um and how are you expecting someone to say yaar you know main khana baad mein khalunga let me go watch a movie right now you know it's not going to happen because there was there was a, a an entire thing uh, uh, done on across certain media channels of how demonetization has affected the film industry you know and and people used to go to theaters at that time and it was very sad for me to see a poster of rock on to on those <laughs> on the wall in 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 some of those clips and not a crow you know uh, in the theater it's completely empty and and you can uh, and understandably so i mean uh, you know you you weren't complaining that why aren't you going you understand but there was also that aspect to that film you know um so um it's it's with that film it's a little difficult for me to to really um understand you know what could have been what should have been it's 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 not possible it's it's a bit tough because of the environment that it released but is there anything that you that you can recall what you would consider perhaps not a failure i think failure is a wrong term because you did what you did uh, but maybe not as expected in terms of the outcome the eventual creative outcome of what you attempted you know oh, no of course i mean that that does happen um, a lot of things can at times not translate from script to screen as effectively as you want um and that does happen you know i it's um i i don't want to take names of those movies because i mean it's not just me you know what i'm saying i mean there's there's other people uh, who have their effort and their talent and their uh, i mean reputations attached to certain things um and it's not fair for me to to speak about about the work just as if it only belongs to me and my learning from it but i mean of course that has happened you know uh, it has happened where you expected certain things to turn out a certain way um and they did you know the, it, it happens to to the best of us and it absolutely has happened right right i mean i think one way uh, to you know sort of define success would also be the fact that you know you maximize your own potential i don't think anyone uh, farhan that i've ever met 
has actually maximized their potential the way you have in terms of the number well, of things you. you've touched upon has been fascinating what a journey it's been um of course you know i'm you know keep we keep in this in this video podcast we keep looking for some story some story that nobody's ever heard should should come out so right before i go i'm going to check with you in case there's an interesting one you know i i must tell you like with with the with the advent of social media zoom and and the amount of interviews that now one has to do when whenever a film is on release i don't think anyone has any story left that they've not told <laughs> <laughs> I think from the color of the diaper that was put on you from the time that you were born, you know, to what you just had for breakfast this very morning, I, I think everything is out in public domain. There is nothing left. So I'm sorry to break your heart. <laughs> I'm going to make one last try. Uh, if you were if on your on your passport, Paran, uh, if you were to write to you know personal identification, you know that thing, and you would probably say the cut under your eye. Your... Oh, it is. It is. On, it is on my passport. It is on your passport, right? Is there a story behind that? Make it up. Well, this, I mean, I, I, I can't really make it up, but I must tell you that whenever, um, when, when I was a kid, I don't know, I, I was obsessed with films. Um, and the, the closest my mind took me to like a war film was like Rambo. You know, I mean, like at that point, because, you know, those were like the things. And I remember in part two, Rambo goes to Vietnam, right? And, and all that stuff that happened. So whenever anybody used to ask me what happened here, and I used to be like, Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> because they cut his face. I don't know if you remember that scene yeah. when he's tied up and the guy takes the dagger and he cuts him here like this. And it was a great moment for me. And I was like, man, this is it, Vietnam. So I just want to say, say that to people. But how did it happen anyway? Um, it, it's a very boring story. I was two years old. I tripped and I fell onto the side of a table. Fair enough. That's what I thought it would be. <laughs> Isn't Vietnam so much more fun? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Let's not let truth get in the way of a great story. Thank you so much, Paran. This was this was fascinating. You're always fun. Uh, thank, thank you, you Mayan. Thank you so much. Subscribe to Midday India. Get direct notifications on all our videos by clicking on the bell icon.